Good morning once again, everyone. Rector Arendelle here from Able Spirit Me, and I am Able. This is video six in the video series, The Book Sealed with Seven Seals. We are lucky to have Jason here, which is uh, one of my new friends who is allowing us to be, um, how, how do I put it? He's, he's exposing us to a new perspective and a new way of interpreting the Bible and other literary works in a way that I personally have not heard before and therefore I'm drawn to it because I love new things. And I hope that uh, you can open your mind up to these possibilities, if nothing else, and draw your own conclusions. But I want to thank everyone who's here watching for being here, and I'm going to let Jason continue on um, talking about day six and beyond. Thank you, Jason. Okay, thank you. So, so we've kind of gone into the the basics of how to see Adam and Eve, and I've kind of given a bit of a teaser about the fact that the the new Adam and Eve of the new world is is actually already here. But the people who are the members of these flesh and bone bodies, they don't even really know that that's who they are. So there's there's people who are of the body of Adam and of the body of Eve that are not self-aware in terms of the part of the body they're in. And the bodies, the collectives of Adam and Eve are not yet self-aware either. And so... This is going to be a bit of a wake-up call to a lot of people because, um, you know, they'll be like, oh, wow, you know, like I'm from an LDS Mormon upbringing and, you know, a lot of people kind of tease Mormons about their concepts of God and that man can become God and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and so even among my uh, LDS colleagues, they're they're going to be kind of blown away by this because they've been being told that they're Adam and Eve right. for ever since the beginning of Mormonism. And they haven't even paid attention to the words of, of their own founder who taught them to consider themselves as though that is who they were. And so, you know, here I've just kind of slipped in, you know, primarily who they are. Right. And when you, when you start to dissect what occurred with Joseph Smith Jr. and in what he founded. A lot of people just think, oh, you know, he founded the church. Mm -hmm. And But when you really scrutinize deeper into the roots of the LDS restoration, is what I call it, that he established not just a church, but he also established a body of priesthood. And in his day, they referred to it as the School of the Prophets. Okay. And, and this is a separate organization from the church organization. And so, in fact, it's these two, I call them covenant bodies, uh, because there are certain covenants that you have to enter into in order to be a member of this body. And essentially what the... Sorry. It's okay. Essentially, what the uh, L restoration is a restoration of. See, a lot of a lot of LDS people think, oh, you know, we restored the church that Jesus established back in in his time, and, and we're the the true church of Jesus Christ. It's kind of where the LDS, you know, Latter Day Saints. <laughs> yeah, that that's their scope. But what they don't seem to realize is what what Joseph Smith. Uh, revealed was actually the fullness of the Father's kingdom, which is way beyond just what a church is. Okay. And and so, in fact, what he did is he, you know, that picture of Michelangelo and oh yes, that, that he had of God, yes, and you know, touching finger to finger kind of thing, right? You know, that's that's the theme forming man is what that imagery depicts and in fact this this uh, oh and, and a beautiful part of that 
that imagery is if, if you look at the Elohim, it's, it's a plurality. You see all these angels and, you know, that are kind of jumbled up together. And the beautiful thing is, if you take a cross-sectional image of, of a human brain and superimpose it, uh, that Elohim and all his angels are shaped. He shaped them in the mind of man. It was kind of a, it's kind of a very beautiful, insightful way of portraying that, that it's that it's this enlightenment that really ultimately uh, puts us in touch with with God. And when you think about when you think about Adam being this enlightened body that encompasses the fullness of the knowledge of what it takes to establish the fullness of the Father's kingdom, then it makes sense that, you know, that entity would would have a lifespan of nearly a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And that instead, you know, archaeologists looking for the hut that the person Adam and Eve lived in, you know, we don't find just evidence of a little hut. We find evidence of a global golden age, which means... You know, we're not talking about 6,000 years ago, two people living in a hut somewhere trying to get this planet populated with human beings. What what we actually find in history is a, a governing body and a, a nurturing church body that, that caused this, this new civilization, a new global civilization to flourish planet-wide. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about Adam and Eve. I got you. And so, and so now if you take America as the setting for the new world and you look at the parallels, like if you look at uh, Mesopotamia, it's this, the fertile crescent and it's got these gigantic rivers and, and it's kind of where human civilization sprung up. That's where the garden of Eden is reported to have been mm -hmm. in the biblical text, you know, the river Tigris, the river Euphrates, and, you know, we all know where that is. And when you look in the new world of America and Joseph Smith says, Hey, uh, Jackson County, Missouri is the garden of Eden. He didn't say necessarily <laughs> is the garden of Eden, but he says it is. And so what do we see here in the new world? We see this fertile plain with these gigantic rivers and, you know, the, the parallel's unmistakable. But then, you know, Adam and Eve, they get they get driven out of the garden, right? Right. Because mm -hmm. they transgress. They do something they shouldn't have done. And, and it, we start into the, the phase of paradise lost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at the LDS history, you know, they gathered in this Jackson County, Missouri, where Joseph Smith said, this is the Garden of Eden. And... What did the saints do there? They got kind of cocky. It's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to rule the world. We're going to this, and you're going to answer to us, and, you know, you're going to be a Mormon whether you want to or not. You know, they got this kind of arrogance and cockiness about them and really irked the, you know, the, the other people that were there in, in that region. And, and, of course, tensions flared up, and, you know, you get all these Mormon people emigrating into that area and voting in political blocks, and, you know, that – that frightens people, and, mm -hmm. and, and the way they went about what they were doing was 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 not with the proper spirit that God would have them compose themselves. Right. You know, he did say to Adam, you know, subdue and take dominion, you know, take the dominion I've given you, but he didn't say to be, you know, cocky, arrogant jerks about <laughs> it, you know. And, and, and there's other things that, that the saints did there in, in Missouri that was, uh, you know, not, God was not happy with. And so ultimately what happens is in 1838, Governor Lilburn Boggs issued the extermination order. Hmm. And, and it was actually legal to murder, kill a Mormon until clear into the, I think it was the 1970s. Wow. That you could actually, if, if you, you know, killed a Mormon <laughs> and you had a good attorney, you weren't going to go to jail. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And, and they did feel that, but, but that's what happened is 
you know, so when you start looking at the LDS restoration and, and the school, the prophets priesthood organization is Adam and the, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the body of Eve. And then you just plug in and follow LDS history. You know, we've got like almost 200 years of history now that we can examine. And when you examine that history, the parallels between the Adam and Eve narrative and the history of the LDS people, it's just absolutely dovetails. It's, it's precise. It, it's an unequivocal fulfillment or manifestation of man in day six. Because, you know, 1830 is right at the tail end of the sixth millennial day. Okay, so you're Which saying that the man, end of uh, the end of uh, day six is more in the 1800s instead of 2020. Well, well, technically day six ended with the year 2000. There, you know, give or take. I, I haven't gotten clarity on if if it's an exact, you know, boom, if, or if there's a little flex. I don't know because it seems to me like you know when it says a day unto the Lord is as a thousand years it doesn't say it is a thousand years so it leaves a little bit of a kind of a some little room is, yeah i got you and you also mentioned some overlap in cycles so it would make sense overlap in days as well yeah so but basically you know give or take you know whatever there is to give or take mm -hmm. 1000 ad to 2000 ad is day six and so we should see man somewhere toward the end of day six Got it. Because it's a culminating accomplishment of that day, that, that era or millennium. And so if, if you look at 1830, when Joseph Smith Jr. was instructed by Revelation to organize the first and second elder of this priesthood, kind of just a very little body, and, and then organize the church, that's when you get... You know, God forms his new world, and then he, he introduces Adam and Eve into it. Mm -hmm. So, basically, uh, establishing America as a melting pot, you know, he brought in the Germans, the Swedes, the Nords, the, the Dutch, the, the British, the Scottish, the Irish, the, the Spaniards, the Portuguese. The, you know, he brought in all of these these uh, ten tribes scattered remnants that had been intermingled and now were basically classed as Gentiles. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he brings all these lineages and, and makes this melting pot in America. And, you know, when it says that God planted all these trees in the garden, right? A tree is, is like, you know, we all have our family tree. It's our heritage. It's our lineage. Right. And so when... When God betrothed the Gentiles and says, I will give you my kingdom, you know, he's offering his kingdom to all the lineages of the Gentiles. And so that's why, you know, you've got all these trees in the garden, because God is offering his Adamic kingdom to the Gentiles first. They get first dibs. And so, of course, God says, you know, partake freely of the fruit of all these trees. In other words, Receive into your bodies, you know, like Jesus eating the broiled fish. Remember that? Mm -hmm. You know, Adam and Eve eating the fruit of these trees. It's like preach to the, the Germans, preach to the Swedish people, preach to the British people. Bring, convert any of these lineages that I've planted here in this new world. And of course, now we get into the controversial subject of well, which one of those trees was forbidden, you know, and that gets a little bit into a dicey conversation. But mm -hmm. hopefully with what I've said, that this kind of further unfolds the, the way that America is actually is literally the biblical new world, not just the cartographer's new world, you know, <laughs> and and. Uh, and, and the Adam and Eve that God introduced into the new world, in fact, was facilitated by the ministry of the prophet Joseph Smith, Jr. Hmm. Okay. A lot to digest there. And, yeah, and, you know, and they transgressed and they fell, and, and things are a really big mess right now. Yeah. So, you know, they're kind of like Mormons will be like, oh, wow, we're really important. Wow, I didn't know that, but oh, crap, we're 
we're in a big mess and we're heavily polluted. And, and you know, because Adam and Eve, you know, they get thrust out and they get chucked out into the lone and dreary world or the, the wilderness and they suffer and they go through intense persecution and tribulation. And, you know, and we've been going through that. The, the LDS people have been, you know, very heavily persecuted. There's a lot about our history a lot of people don't know. But when you line it up with the Adam and Eve narrative, it's just, you know, poof. and then you get into, you know, we're far enough into this that we can also, and we'll save this for future segment, is, you know, who, now the question is, well, who's the man child born of the woman? You know, who's able? You know, you like to say, I am able, and you're probably like, oh, well, this might be interesting because now, you know, who is the, who is the able of the new world? You know, yeah. and who's the cane of the new world? And, yeah. and so on and so on. Because, because this narrative continues. The, the pattern is, it's, you know, it's the pattern, the cycle of creation. Well, you just baited me pretty and, well. <laughs> now, <laughs> now I want to know. I, um, I think that we should stop this video at a good point like this. But I want to just point out one thing that clicked in my mind while you were doing your narrative. And that is you kept saying that people don't know uh, who – they don't know that they're part of this new super consciousness and that uh -huh. um, they have to become self-aware. And – I found that, uh, you know, you and I come from completely different backgrounds, but the the language has correlation. Self-realization. People don't even call uh -huh. enlightenment in the Hindu faith. They call it self-realization, where you realize okay. who you yeah. are, your true it's identity. So uh, it's very interesting that, uh, I mean, enlightenment, that's kind of more of a Buddhist term, you know? And Buddhism also came okay. out of India originally. People don't know that. They think it's... You know, they picture a big old fat Buddha in China, but he's actually a very skinny Indian guy from India. <laughs> but anyway, okay. um, yeah. but yeah, self-realization would be uh, another term for self-awareness. And uh, that equals your identity, becoming aware of who you are at the soul level, which would mean that you are recognizing that you are part of the super consciousness and there's also an interesting uh -huh. thing that people are saying right now is we are one. Um, I don't know how, how much you are aware of New Age philosophies, but a lot of people are starting to come to the conclusion that we are sharing a super consciousness. So even though people uh -huh. may not agree with what you're saying um, about how uh, LDS fits into the mix, the correlation with uh, the super consciousness and the realization of your soul identity, yeah. it's all there. Which is why I find it very interesting because there's all kinds of ways yes, to this, go ahead. This uh, I love everything you just said, and, and it accords with me beautifully. And and it's sad because this is all stuff that Joseph Smith Jr. was actually endeavoring to establish at his point in time. Yeah, and it was it's just, just so early. Just <laughs> no, they're not ready for it, and a lot of people still aren't ready for it. I know people probably yeah. don't want to hear. Yeah. That a certain prophet is the answer. And also, we don't know yeah. if the interpretations of what a certain prophet wrote were interpreted correctly. So I think that's why we should uh, keep listening because open opening your mind up to possibilities is the key to making new connections. So I'm enjoying this and I look forward to letting you continue on with um, the next step, like you said, Cain and Abel and uh, everything else. But we should cut this off now. Um, thank you once okay. again, Jason. Very interesting stuff. And uh, see you next time. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you.